this morning is, is entitled, Generous Like Our Father. And we said at the beginning of the month, last time I preached, um, the, first, the, first of this, the first Sunday of this month, we looked at the generosity of God. So it, it, we're going to build on that. So if you guys haven't listened to that, maybe you want to go back. Because to be generous like our Father, we need to understand how generous is our Father. Um, and so we looked at the fact that God's generosity is astounding. It is, it is abundant and ridiculously more than. In fact, God isn't just generous in the fact of it's something that he does. It is a quality of who he is. He is generosity. And, and we, we looked at the fact that his generosity is, as I said, just abundant. But the other side of his generosity, which we need to pay attention to if we're going to be generous like our father, is his generosity reached to everyone. Those who were for for him and those who were against him. Those that were his friends and those that were his enemies. He was generous to all. Um, And so so we we, we looked at at his generosity, but also the fact that his generosity is endless. He is sufficient. He never lacks anything. So he's never like, well, I can't be too generous here. Because what if I I run out? He, He never will. And so as we come in to look at it, our part in generosity and being, being generous like our Father, we need to understand where our generosity, we get to be able to stem that generosity from. And it's Him. So our generosity doesn't need to be meted out according to us. We give with a generosity that is He's our source. And so it's abundant. So we're going to look at generosity. And first and foremost, let's be honest, generosity is not about what's in our pockets or in our wallets or in our bank accounts, but it's about what's in our heart. It is that avert, being overtly and outwardly the demonstration of God's goodness through our whole life. A generous person is, is as I said, it's, it's a whole life thing. So it's, it's about a generous person gives with a, without the benefit of the doubt, with, a, with giving the benefit of the doubt. A generous person treats others with respect, isn't worried about the act of, what the act of giving may cost in terms of time or effort, doesn't wait to be asked, and doesn't expect anything in return. And this is an important one. Biblically, biblical generosity is always given with no expectation of return. It is just lavish. And this is the generosity of God. And, and, and we as Christians give like that because that's how we've experienced God's generosity. Just lavish, not expecting anything in return. Most of us equate generosity to financial giving, and, and that is a part of it. It's a core of it. But it also is about respect and politeness and self-control and patience these are all explain the generous spirit. Think about it. Every day we have the opportunity to exercise a generous spirit and respond <laughs> to impatience with patience. Th- this is challenging. It's easier to give money. <laughs> um, to reply in a hurried and, or, or, uh, to a hurried and thoughtless comment with an expression of understanding. To overlook what you don't like in someone so that you can find what you do. That is the generosity of God. And let's be honest, it doesn't come naturally. We, we have to teach our children to be generous. What is the first thing that the kids go? Mine. <laughs> it's mine. We get, you know, you think, okay, it's going to improve by the time you get to teenagers. But mine just changes to, that's not fair when we get to teenagers. It's about fairness. So what we're saying is, mine. <laughs> he shouldn't be getting it. It's about me. And when we get to adults, we just so overwhelmed, we just do nothing. And so, so all of us need to de- develop this culture, culture of generosity. Um, and we can. A lot of us go, well, well I, I just, I don't know. You know, I just can't be generous be, or be that generous. First of all, every good and perfect gift in James 1 says is from above. We get whatever we ask to give from him. The other thing it says is that we are made in his image. If he is generous, and he is, then we can be generous. Generosity is in our reach because we are his children. Um, But let's be honest, as we know with everybody, these lessons are better caught than taught. And we we, let's for me the best example of of generosity is Matthew uh, sorry, Mark twelve, and we're gonna read from forty one to forty four. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Just so that you know what this looked like, they were receptacles that looked like the old gramophones. You know, this big funnel? And the idea was that they threw in the coins, and the one with the most noise gave the most. So it was a big deal in how they gave. So it was, it was out there and seen by everyone. Many rich people drew in large amounts, threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put two small copper coins worth only a few cents. That word, 
poor, poor is not just poor. It's the, in Greek, it's the word destitute or pauper. In other words, she was homeless. She was the poorest of the poor. And those two copper coins were mites, which is the lowest denomination in Roman um, coinage. And it, it basically wouldn't have bought you a loaf of bread. So what she gave was very little. Interestingly enough, from a Roman perspective, because don't forget that and, and this is all taking place in a, in a Roman society. Although they were Jewish, they had this Roman occupation. And as far as Roman understanding was, they did not expect anybody who wasn't wealthy to be generous. Generous was something that was about the wealthy. They were the benefactors. But with the Roman understanding of generosity, there was always um, <laughs> there's, there's this give and take. If you were generous, there will be some political pushback or, or business sidelines. So that is their understanding of generosity. Watch what Jesus does with it in this understanding. Verse 43. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. It's quite a statement. She didn't say, wow, she put in a lot. Wow, she put in, you know, as much as one or two or as much as all of them. No, he says she put in more than all of them. You're like, well, Jesus is your maths a little bit off. Because these guys have given in their abundance. It says they, they gave out of their wealth, their, their abundance. But she, out of her poverty. But here's Jesus' understanding. But she put in everything, all that she had to live on. You see, Jesus, when he looks at our generosity, he doesn't go, no, this uh, generosity is only for the rich. Because we, we'd love to do that. We go, yeah, I'll give when, I'm, when I've got more. I'll give when I'm rich. Let's be honest. If we don't learn to give now, we're never going to give. It's about learning to give. And for, for God's understanding, as we said in the beginning, it's a heart condition. And, and Jesus looks and he goes, you know what? She gave all more than all because his understanding is that it's the extent of her sacrifice. Her generosity was measured by the extent of her sacrifice, not about how much she gave. Attitude is more important to Jesus than what's in the action. And so that, that is where we get to, and, and we understand that. We look at and we see that it's so, generosity has so much importance to Jesus, but probably more than we understand. I don't know if you know this, but there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Someone counted, not me. Um, 7,000 promises in Scripture that God gives to us. Promises that, promises towards, promises for. And, and in, in his promises, there is always, um, in every promise, there's a premise. The number one thing that God promises about is, is connected to generosity. More promises are related to generosity than any other thing in, in the Bible. So I think we need to pay attention to these promises. And God's going, it's important. It's so much so that I will promise you so much if you will just be generous. And it's about being generous in every area of our life. Our money, our time, our energy, even generous in our praise. Sometimes we're like, <laughs> and God's like, no, no, generosity in every part of your life. Your talents in every area. Generosity is becoming unselfish. But why is God so invested in this, this thing of generosity? Because generosity in God's economy is love in action. And God is love. If, if you really love your husband or your wife or your kids or God or God's people, there needs to be a, a reaction to that. There needs to be generosity seen in that love. Oh, it's not love. And I promise you the person hasn't felt love. There needs to be that action. We, we, we understand that God says, for God so loved, he gave. Love is about giving, not about getting. In fact, scripturally, love that gets is called lust. Although most of our love songs are about what we get out of it. You make me feel like a natural woman or whatever. Um, but, but you understand what I'm saying. There, there's always this, this thing about, about getting. And, and, and God is love and he is a giver. Without, do you understand that without, without his generosity, we would have nothing. The fact that you're here this morning is because of the generosity of God. Our life is a sheer gift from God. The air we breathe, the sunshine, the mind we think of, even our ability to earn is because of God's generosity. God wants us to be like him. He wants us to be generous like our father. And so we're going to look at verses and there's, 
12, I'm going to take 12 promises out of the thousands. I'm going to take 12 promises related to generosity. And, and I want us to look at their benefits that God speaks about. Let's see what happens every time I am generous in God's eyes. So number one, are you all with me? Number one, generosity honors God. Generosity is an act of worship. And it is the act of giving. And it's recognition that everything that I have, everything that I am, is a gift from him. 2 Corinthians 9 says, they will glor- give glory to God for your generosity to them. In other words, you will, you will glorify God with your generous gifts. Um, then it says, later on, it says, to all believers will, so all believers will prove through their generosity that, that, that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Generosity points to God. It gives God honor. Proverbs 14.31, it says, um, but he who is generous in, um, to the needy honors his maker. We honor God when we give. Number two, generosity draws us closer to God. We all know that thing of whatever I invest in, whatever I pour myself into is is where my heart is. Whatever I'm interested in, where my input is, is where my heart is. I can invest my money, my energy, my time, and that takes me. So whatever I invest in is what draws me, what I'm closest to. And we're invited in Scripture to invest in God, to invest in His work, in His heart, what is on His heart. It not only honors Him, but we are drawn closer to Him as we invest in Him, in our generosity. Does that make sense? Whenever whenever I, um, I give my money, my time, my energy to Him and for Him, it attracts me. Right, Deuteronomy says um, in, in chapter 14, it says, bring the tithe. Tithe literally means 10%. Bring the 10% of your income to the design place of worship, the church, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. The purpose of giving, of giving our tithes, of giving all that we have, is to teach us to always put God first in our lives. And when we put God number one, he becomes that in our lives. And we draw closer to him. Right. It, it, it says in Matthew, um, in Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, your heart is where your treasure is. If you want to draw closer to God, we must put all our treasure there and aim our generosity to his heart. What's on his heart? Number three, generosity makes me more like Jesus. Let's be honest. Jesus is the most generous person who has ever lived. He gave up the throne of heaven. He came to earth to live as man, and he sacrificed him, his own life, for you and for me. The Bible says we are saved because of his generosity, the generosity of Jesus. Every time we follow his heart, and you give time and money and energy or anything, you become more like Jesus. The act of giving is the act of Jesus. Every time you give, your heart grows bigger, and you become more like Jesus. Proverbs 21, 26 says, Some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. The more godly you become, the more generous you are. And to be honest, the more generous you are, the more godly you become in God's economy. Luke eleven forty one says, Purity is best demonstrated by generosity. Now, purity is a word we go, ah, we fall horribly short. You could put righteousness there. Still, uh, we put, could put holiness there, even worse. But it all means the same thing. It means the life of Jesus. It, it means the, the, the holiness is the life of Jesus. So to say, we could read that, in living a, a life set apart for Jesus is to be a giver. A life set apart for Jesus is demonstrated by generosity. Does that make sense? Okay, I was, I was reading a, a, a thing about a, a dad and a boy the other day, and it was very sweet. I, I can relate. This dad was taking his little kid in the back seat. He said, let's, let's go and get fries from McDonald's. Anybody ever done that? You're healthy people. Um, so, so he pulled into the drive-thru, and he got his little son his fries, and he gave it to him. And they just pulled out, and the dad leant over to grab one. What do you think the son's response was? <laughs> mine. <laughs> no, you can't have. They mine. And I just smiled at the dad's response and he says, you know, <laughs> my son seems to have forgotten that I am the source of all fries for him. <laughs> I brought him here. I paid for the fries. I handed him the fries. I am the Lord of all fries. 
Um, and, and so he would have no prize in his life if it wasn't for me. Um, and, and as his dad, I could take away all his fries. But just as quickly, I could, I could go back and buy him ten times more. I am the dad of all fries. But, and I, I didn't really need the chip. But as a dad, I, I wanted him to learn to share, to be kind, to be generous like me. And I think God's a lot like that dad. I think he's got those same lessons that he wants to teach us. Um, he is the source of all fries. <laughs> We came into this world without stuff. We're going to leave without stuff. My grandpa was an undertaker. I saw many funerals, drove in many hearses. There ain't nothing in there. You don't take it with you. You don't. It, 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 is, about, it, it is about Jesus and what God entrusts to us and what we do with what he's entrusted to us. But it's his, not ours. We're just loaning it. And then God's idea for us is that, again, that he, he is sovereign. He is the source of all fries. And, and he wants us to learn to give like him. He is a generous giver. And he wants us to learn to share, to give. Okay, number four. Generosity is the cure to materialism. Now, that's assuming that you want a cure to materialism, but I won't judge you and ask you at this point. Materialism, let's be honest, is all about getting and getting more. Get, 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 get. Materialism is about taking in. It's about acquiring, hoarding, getting more and more stuff, money, whatever that is. Biblically, the only do- antidote to materialism is giving. That's the antidote to, to, to um, materialism. You say, but I'm not materialistic. Look, you can say that, but if you're not giving, if you're not generous, then that's not true. We battle with materialism, and the only way to overcome that is by being generous. Every time you give, you break the grip of materialism over our lives. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, You cannot serve two masters, God and money. Please note that it doesn't say, say you, you should not. It says you cannot. You're either doing one or the other. It's not, well, maybe. No. But it's like, it's, you cannot. So you're doing one of them. Which one are you doing? What is number one in your life? What is more important to you? Stuff, richness, what everybody thinks, my status, whatever, or serving God? That's the question. In this consumer culture, let's be honest, it's pretty hard to fight materialism. We're caught up with the latest brands and things, and our net worth is related to our self-worth, and we value the valuables and all that nonsense. But... We, we, we go and switch on the, the phone or social media, and then there's all these ads that suddenly, isn't it amazing how suddenly you see a product that you've never knew existed? But by seeing it, you're like, I have to have that. How can I live without it? We didn't even know it existed five minutes ago, but now we can't live without it. I think we all need to examine ourselves about this materialism and turn our hearts toward God and serve Him and, and be generous unto Him. 2 Timothy 6 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He doesn't want us just to survive. He wants us to thrive his way, not our way. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. Sounds just like the dad with the fries. Um, we don't know what we're really living for until we live God's way, until we choose to be de- um, um, generous in our lives. Number five, generosity demonstrates my faith. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is an A no one. I like to think I'm a person of faith, but Scripture says your generosity is seen in your faith because it shows are you trusting in the promises of God? It shows, what do I believe? That God will take care of you when you obey him. Do you believe when God says, I want you to give generously? Then you go, oh, but what about if I I don't have enough? Generosity shows our faith and our trust in God. 2 Corinthians 9 says, moreover, your very giving (laughs) proves the reality of your faith. Philemon 6. There is a book named that in the Bible. Welcome. Um, And it says, And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith. And as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ, we are to be generous because of faith. 
Stinginess is caused by unbelief. I don't really believe God can care for me. If I, can, if, if I can give this away, then what if I don't have enough for me? Then it breeds worry, then it breeds fear, and we're back to unbelief. Stinginess is caused by unbelief. Maybe if I'm battling with generosity, I need to step back and go, how's my faith? Do I trust this generous God who I cannot outgive? Because he's trustworthy. Malachi, he, he, he invites us into this to be generous because of our faith in Malachi 3.10. It says, bring all the tithes, the, the 10% of your, of your income, into the storehouse, which is the church, so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heavenly armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. Listen to the promise. This is not just a pie in the sky promise. This is for me and you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. The only time in scripture God says, test me. And it's on this. God's saying, I dare you. I dare you. This is the way we, we get to prove God's existence. By tithing, by giving, and seeing that, that how God will bless you. How God will come through. Time and time again. Generosity demonstrates our faith. Number six. Generosity reveals our character. It shows what kind of heart we have. Are we generous? Or are we, do we have a stingy, selfish heart or an unselfish heart? A generous heart or a stingy heart? Giving, generosity shows that my heart, shows my, my heart is really like. Can I put my heart under the microscope and what is going to be seen? Is it a generous, um, unselfish heart? The Bible says that God uses money and stuff to test and see if he can trust us with what he wants to give us. Sometimes we go, why doesn't God trust me? Why can't I do these things? And God says, but what have you done with the little, the money, the stuff that I already entrusted you with? Luke 16 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Again, it comes down to our heart. The Bible says if we are faithful with that which is not our own, that which he loans to us here on earth, he will give us, he will bless us greatly and give us even more than we can understand here and into eternity. Revelation 22 says, he says, look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. So how, how are we to be living? Luke 16 says, and if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with two riches of heaven? The answer to that question is no one. Not God, no one. If we're not, if we're, if we're untrustly with worldly wealth, no one's going to trust you with more, including God. Your reward and responsibilities um, that you have in heaven are going to be based on how you manage what He's given you in your generosity here now. What we do here and now has far reaching effects. Are you still with me? The last two? Um, okay. Generosity brings God's blessings. Interestingly enough, there are over a hundred references, oh, I'm sorry, a hundred promises of God that are linked to God blessing because of generosity, because of your generosity. That's the goodness of God. He's like, I'm encouraging you to give so I can give. His heart is, he is generous. He can't but want to give. And he's like, come on, give. You, you, why does he do that? It's about an open hand policy. When I give, my hands are open. And what does God do? He fills them again. And I get to get to give again. And he fills it again. That is the picture of scripture. But when I'm stingy, what do we do? Mine. And not only do I not give, but I do not get. That, that's the picture of biblical generosity. Be open-handed. Because God's going, give and so I can pour into you. Give. You give to me and I'll give. You give to others and I'll give. You can't outgive me. We cannot outgive God. We're so scared that we can, but I promise you we can't. Proverbs um, 22 says, Generous people will be blessed because they share their food with the poor. God said it, and it's true. Deuteronomy 15 says, Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord will bless you. Listen to how he'll bless you. He'll bless you in all your work and everything you put your hand to. 
People come to me and say, Mel, will you pray that God blesses everything I do? My work and my family and everything I put my hand to. Scripture says, okay, I will do that. But there's a, there's a premise to this promise. You be generous and I'm going to bless everything you put your hand to. And notice it's before, not after. A friend, I was speaking to a friend of mine and he said, I learned, God taught me that generosity had to start when I didn't have a job. When I didn't have food in the cupboard or money in my account. In those places, I needed to start to be generous. And when I was generous in those places, God goes, awesome. Let me fill. It's not a waiting to when I. It's because of who. <laughs> God's got this and he's giving it to us. Um, so um, what God, what God, <laughs> we want to God to bless us with everything um, that we put our hand to. So we need to give generously. 2 Corinthians 9, it says, each of you should give. And what you, whatever you decide in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You see God's promises. He said, you can't outgive God. He's going, guys, when you do, when you give, I'm going to come and I'm going to bless in every aspect of your life abundantly. Generosity increases my happiness. I want to say everybody knows this except those who aren't generous. <laughs> Acts 20, 35 says, In everything I have given you an example of how, by working hard like this, you must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Yeshua, there is more happiness in giving than receiving. Can I just say something? When I was a kid, I did not get more joy in giving than receiving. When I was a kid... I was, it was all about what I was getting, how big I was, whatever I was getting, and how many of whatever I was getting. And, and, and that, that's real. We've all been there. But now as an adult, I, it's this amazing thing of I love watching the expression of people when they, when they receive, when I get to give. It is such a blessing. What's the difference? Maturity. It used to be all be about me, but it's not about me anymore. The sad thing is a lot of us have never grown up. It's still all about us. I don't want to give. It's about me. And I need to be happy. And I need to be comfortable. And I need to get what I want. And God going, yeah, you're missing out on the joy of generosity. And when you see me blessing you and others as you give. So grow up and give. Number nine. Generosity expands my influence. And we all want to put on our humility coats here and go, oh, no, no, <laughs> I don't want to be, have influence. And God's like, no, no, <laughs> I want you to have influence for my kingdom. I want you to have greater impact to carry me and what I have for you. So influence is a big deal in the kingdom. I want to give you responsibility and influence. And it says the more generous you are, the more influential you'll become, the more greater impact you'll have. But again, biblical influence is not about what you have. Biblical influence is always about what you give. Always about what you give. Proverbs 11, 20, uh, 24 says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. People want to be around generous people. People want to hear what you have to say. You, you get a gap. You, people go, oh, why are you like you are? That's the influence. That's the impact that generosity wins for you. Psalm 112 verse 9 says, They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. You cannot outgive God. God says, you give to me, I will give to you. Generous, we can be generous and trust in him. And he will increase our influence for him and for his kingdom. So give. Man, we want to extend his kingdom. We pray, your kingdom come, your will to be done. And he says, great, then be generous with yourself, with your stuff, with your time, with your money, with your talents, with everything. Number 10, generosity multiplies my money. God has worked out the universe in such an amazing way. He, he's put things into p place that work very differently to the systems of the world, but I have seen it time and time again. He's put things into play where if we give Listen, all that we have is God's. And he requires 10% of what is his to be given back to him. So we give back the 10%. But biblically, here's the miracle. Here's the miracle. When I give that 10%, he makes the 90 go further than if I'd had the 100 to begin with. 
That's the economy of God. Again, he says, give me what I ask for and you're going to get way more than you imagine. It doesn't make sense in your balance sheet. Never going to. We're called to live by faith, not by certainty. Opposite of faith is not unbelief. Opposite of faith is certainty. God's like, I didn't call you to certainty. It's not going to look right on your expense sheet. But it's going to look right in my kingdom and I'm going to bless it. So give. Proverbs 11.25 A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. 2 Corinthians 9.11 Yes, you will be enriched. And that word enriched means you're going to have more than you have right now. I'm going to give you more riches in whatever capacity. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous. But (laughs) let me just stop here. God's going to give you, but it's not for the purpose of me. It's not so that I can be a fat cat or I can have more stuff and my bank balance can look great and I can have everything in the world. That's not why he's going to bless us. We we are are enriched so that you can give even more generously into his kingdom. We are blessed to be a blessing. That's the, the idea of scripture. Again, he doesn't say this. He says, I've given you stuff to enjoy. I've given you stuff to, to, be, to, to not just thrive, uh, to survive, but thrive. But your life needs to be focused on me. And it's about living for me and unto me and giving to me. And you will see me, me give you again and again and again. Generosity. God is gracious and he will multiply our money through generosity. Number 11. Generosity brings God's protection. How's that? It brings up his protection to our family, our businesses, our own life. Psalm 112, 5 and 6 says, And all goes well for the generous man who conducts his business fairly. Such a man will not be overthrown by evil circumstances. Please note, it doesn't say won't have evil circumstances. He's saying, but when you're generous, I've got your back. Nothing's going to take you out. I am the God who's going to make sure that you're going to come through that you're still going to be standing, no matter what. So generosity, God says, one of the promises of generosity is his protection. He says, I've got your back. God's constant care, it continues to say, of him will make a deep impression on all who see it. And people, again, it's a part of your testimony. People will see it and go, oh, what a God. What a God. Last one, number 12. Generosity will be rewarded in heaven 1 Timothy 6 says, Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give happily to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up real treasure for themselves in heaven. It's the only safe investment for eternity. And they will be living a fruitful, and they will be living a fruitful Christian life down here. Listen, as I said, we, can't, we don't take anything with us. We can't take anything with us, but you can send it on. Scripture says we can do what we do now. Four times in Scripture, Jesus says we store up treasures in heaven. What we do now is impacting our eternity. And in the bigger scheme of things, do I want stuff for 80 years or do I want stuff for eternity? And scripture says we get to store it up. How do we store it up? We invest in the things that we take with us. The only two things that we get to take with us is the word of God and the people that are touched by him have come into his kingdom. So we get to invest in daring faith for ourselves and others. We get to invest in, in, in people, getting people to heaven. We get to invest in getting people strong. We get to invest in growing people in the kingdom. You see, Going back to that verse, the number, verse 18, it says, tell them to use their money. We need to use our money and our stuff and our talents and our times and our influences to do good, it says there, to do good. Money is to be used, not to be loved. When we love money, we use people. Biblically, we need to use money and love people. So many times people are like, oh, money, the Bible says money is evil. No, it doesn't. Read the Bible. In in 1 Timothy 6.10 it says, for the love of money is evil. Money is neutral. It's neither good nor bad. But it's how you will use it. And if you know that God has entrusted at that money and it is to sow into his kingdom. Luke 16.9 says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit, note, 
others. Let me read that again. Use your worldly resources to benefit others. And make friends. Now, this is not buying friends. Don't, don't, yeah. Re, let me explain. Then when, you pro, when, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Those friends are the people that your money or your stuff or your time or your talents or whatever you've invested into God's kingdom has touched them in such a way that they are in heaven because of what you gave. Those are the friends. And that's why they welcome you into the eternal home of going, I am here because of you. Who's in heaven because of you? Is the question this morning. Because of me. Who's in heaven because of my generosity? Did you sponsor a ministry? Did you buy a Bible? Did you sponsor a project? Did you teach? Did you feed? Did you build a church? Did you help in a program? There's so many ways that we get to pour into this. Did you help someone in need? And are there people going, I'm here in heaven because you gave. Everything I invest in God's work and, um, and into others, I'm going to see again in heaven. Where do I keep and where do I invest my greatest wealth? Generosity will be rewarded in heaven. You know, I think the world is yearning to see some generous generosity and Christians ought to lead the way because our God is that example. We, are, we need to be generous like our Father. We ought to be known as people who will love others and care about the, uh, the needs of people and those less fortunate with us. And, and it's not just about standing around talking about it. It's actually getting in there, getting your hands dirty, spending time, investing into lives. Why? Because we ourselves are the first recipients of generosity. For God so loved, he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him and would have eternal life. He gave us his only son. We've received him as savior and we get to live with him here on earth and into eternity. We are able to be live free from guilt because we are loved so much. This is how much he pours out of that generosity into us. So we just need to come and take it. Maybe you've never received the generosity of God. And this morning, maybe you're going, yo, I want to be part of a God that is just that good. That pours out his abundance in every aspect of my life. That gives me forgiveness and grace and a new life and ability to live that new life and to do it with him in love. There is no better place. Maybe that's you and you're going, oh, I need to accept his generosity. Maybe some of us are going, wow, Mel, that's a tall order you read this morning. Maybe we need to stop again and and, and encounter the generosity of God so that we can. Be generous like our Father. So this morning we get to share in the most gen- in that most generous thing that God has done. We get to share in communion, which is a picture of God's extravagant generosity. His life that was laid out, His blood that was, His body that was broken, so that all that held me in bondage could be broken off me. His blood that was shed so that that which was staining my life can be washed away and a new life can run through my veins. I'm going to pray in a moment for us to come and receive that, if that's you. If you are a Christian and this is your act of of thanking God for his generosity, I'm going to invite you up. But if maybe you're sitting in there going, I want to receive God's generosity this morning for the first time, then I want to pray for you too. Let's pray. So, Father God, thank you that you are the most generous Father. Thank you that you gave everything. We are here because of you gave, but you have more for us, and you want to give us life and life to the full in your Son. And so, Lord, if there are any here this morning that have never given, received your generosity and given their life in exchange for all that you give, if that's you this morning, right where you are, just just. And just where you are, just say, Lord, I receive your generosity. I receive your life, your forgiveness, and the new life that you give me. Thank you, Father. And for the rest of us, Father, we just give you thanks for your generous act of the cross and the new life that we get to live in. Amen.